it's been a while. Over the last few months I've been really busy with work so I haven't been able to make a video to keep you guys updated. But as we reach the end of 2021, I wanted to make a video sort of looking at the film industry and where I think it's heading in the next year. This video is about, it's my thoughts and opinions really about on some of the big topics that are sort of affecting film. So to start, we've got Kodak and Fujifilm. Over the last two years, Kodak's prices have increased 40%. Um, that's quite a massive margin. Kodak is one of the largest producers of films and this has a trickle-down effect in the industry. Um, it's them and Fujifilm who are the two big hitters in this industry and they produce the bulk of the world's film supply. Um, there many of the smaller companies rely on Kodak to offer them emulsions from their back catalogue. Um, so by them increasing prices and saying the cost of manufacturing is going up, that's going to have a trickle down effect. Kodak's recent moves and actions suggest that they're not seizing the opportunity that's available to them. They're the biggest hitter alongside Fujifilm and they have the opportunity to shape and create a future, a sustainable future for the film industry as a whole but they don't seem to be taking it. Instead, they're acting in a reactive way to some of their smaller rivals, um, such as Ilford, and by releasing a disposable camera um, in today's market when single-use plastic isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, they've got the resources available to them to create new film stocks, as we all know, and as you're watching this video, we're in a new wave of film photography. There's a new generation of photographers coming through and there's new insight, there's new methods, there's new thoughts, new approaches. But, and Kodak have the ability to supply new products to this market and people will grab it with both hands. But instead, they're looking back and looking inside and going around in circles and re-releasing products or just sticking by their guns and arguably making the same mistakes the second time around as what got into, into trouble when digital came on the scene. They don't have to revolutionise film photography but it would be good to see them sort of facilitate the new generation a bit more. You see it with other companies, for example Lomography, they're always looking to do something a bit left field or a bit different or celebrate something that's new and emerging or just give a voice to that. Um, sometimes I feel like Kodak's just, they're a bit trapped in the old days. On the other hand, uh, this duopoly that we have it is Fujifilm. Um, and if, any, if you've been keeping abreast of the film news in the past year, two years, Fujifilm seem to be killing off their stocks in their back catalogue almost on a monthly basis now. And what is left is a fraction of what was about three, four, five years ago. By Fujifilm taking films off the market, off the shelves, it leaves consumers with less options with brands they're familiar with. And because they're the only other really real big hitter, it is just given market share to Kodak, but then you're removing a rival from Kodak, so Kodak doesn't have to fight for anything. But Fujifilm have been looking like they're pulling their hands out of the um, film market, but at the same time they've just released the new Instax Pro Evo, which is really forward thinking. I think that it's, this could be a milestone for instant photography. It's sort of this weird middle ground between a digital and an analog camera, and I think it combines a lot of things that the modern instant shooter might be looking for, and it does it in quite an innovative way. And the design of it is it looks like it's a professional product that you could see a professional photographer incorporating into their workflow. Being put off by Kodak prices, try and dig a bit deeper and you can find some really great stocks which are cheaper and saves money. I mean like Lomo 800 for example has a great stock and that's, that's cheaper than Portra. I mean it's not a one-to-one -one the same but it's a great stock. In terms of saving money in the modern film photography world, there is actually quite a lot of options. Um, it's quite daunting at first, um, but once you dig in, you, you establish your workflow, um, you can find ways to save money here and there. Um, 
You can shoot different formats. You can try half frame. This is something I've been wanting to try for a while, because it's quite an interesting concept. But essentially a half frame camera is a 35mm camera where it's only shooting half of the frame essentially. So that means you get twice as many photos to a roll. So on a roll of 36 you'll get 72 photos. Also, if you don't mind a bit of grain, you can try expired stocks. Expired stocks doesn't necessarily mean you have to sacrifice quality though. Um, obviously it's a bit more of a lottery, but if you get a good stock that's been well looked after, it's very hard to tell the difference, especially if you're only sharing to like social media and you're not, say, making big prints with it. Um, it makes you save money massively is scanning your own film. This is something that I started doing um, earlier this year and has cut my post-shooting costs down by half. Um, where in my local lab it'd be to get a, a roll developed and scanned it would be £10 but just to get it developed it costs £5. Also by scanning your own film you get to learn a lot more about the characteristics of the emulsions you're shooting and how to get the best out of a negative and I think there's some people who almost take the lab scans as gospel um, but when the lab uh, are scanning your negatives they're interpreting it but they're not interpreting it with any artistic vision in mind they're just giving you something neutral just to give you an image um, obviously you can talk to your lab and like get to tweak but having that direct control over it gives you a vast you can actually impart a vision onto it um, so that's when people say oh, I don't edit my scans well someone's editing your scans mate you just don't realize that yet. <laughs> another method of saving money is bulk loading this is one that I haven't actually explored yet, but I probably will do eventually, particularly with Kodak, <laughs> Triax or something like that, the way the prices are going, just to save some money. And there's just another one, which is just simple pragmatism. Um, if there's a period when you can't afford to shoot film, then you don't have to shoot film, no one's telling you to shoot film. Um, if you have a digital camera or your phone, you can just use that. I mean, at the end of this, photography. So. Um, obviously, we have preferences and obviously we like the look of certain things and experience but there are some times when film might not necessarily be available. Um, also you can use digital to help your film practice as if you have an idea for a light step in mind instead of just shooting a test roll of film you can just take some digital photos and just to see um, so it doesn't necessarily have to always be filmed forever. Um, and this feeds into my next big topic really. Film or digital? We live in a time in social media and in real life that we believe that everything has to be an absolute. You're, it's either black or white, you're either in or out. But when it comes to art, it doesn't have to be that. It never has to be that. Um, and a lot of the times, some of that blurry middle ground, that's when the great stuff can happen. So in this great debate, eternal debate of film or digital, I think in 2022, there's a place for both. Um, obviously, I think I'm more film leaning, hence the channel. But there's doesn't mean to say that I'm shunning digital totally. Um, there's aspects in my work outside of this channel where digital actually works a lot better. Um, for example, just for reference or research photography, where it's just photos just for me that I'll just see, just so I can just see something just for reference. That then digital makes a lot more sense instead of waiting to get a roll of film developed. I can just take the snap, put it on my laptop, it's done. Also, like I said earlier, digital can sort of fit into your film photography workflow. You, if you want to test something out quickly, if you just want to just check reference with something, if you want, even check an exposure, if you don't have an external light in its hand, you can use your digital camera for reference. Um, I think at the end of the day, this is a medium of art, so it's all about getting your artistic vision out there. Um, so if you use a digital camera to help feed your vision for an, a medium format film photo then there's nothing wrong with that that's just the same as like making a sketch in a sketchbook and then using that sketchbook to make a final design 
representation and inclusivity. I think photography, as with any artistic medium or medium of expression, it's for everyone. Um, so I think in the film community, um, to, I have seen it firsthand in like certain circles and social media where I think where there's an element of gatekeeping or there's some toxic attitudes but I'd say as a whole the film community is actually really really supportive and it's great um, but I think you do see those pockets as you do in all aspects of society um, but I think as a community we should seek to embrace the we should seek to embrace each other's perspectives and not get caught up in these ideas and these traditions on how stuff should be done or what sort of stuff is classed as good or bad um, and who who can take the photos and who should be taking the photos and who should be stood in front of the camera um, so I think when you bring new people in and with new ideas new perspectives and you celebrate that and you give them a platform to express their stories and their ideas and their visions then the community as a whole grows and it can move forward um, as there's new perspectives and it doesn't get stale on old ideas and it doesn't get trapped in the echo chamber um, and I think this is very much representative for wider, wider society as well um, so when you do bring those new people regardless of their backgrounds they can bring some fresh eyes to it and they can rejuvenate it and they it can it makes people feel heard and then when someone who might be younger or who never thought might, photography might not be for them and then they discover a story and then it appeals to them and then you've got a new person in the community then who wouldn't have done it before because they've seen something which has actually responded to them and that's a good that's something that only can be a good thing especially in the state of which the film market is at the moment Surely the more people bring in new ideas, new perspectives and just looking to get involved it can only be a good thing. So support each other out there and whether you like another person's work or not, it, but you shouldn't seek to stop them from doing something they love. As if we all had something we love taken away in terms of like photography, being told to stop doing it, then that's quite a horrible thing. So we should look to support each other. This video is a bit different today. Um, I'm looking to put out some a lot more videos. I do have a huge list of videos I want to put out, and I've got a lot of photos I want to share with you. So hang in there, and I'll start chilling out very soon. Hope you enjoyed the video.